Hello, I'm J.D. Harrington, Public Affairs Officer for NASA's Science Mission Directorate in Washington, D.C. I'd like to welcome you today to t today's L14 Media Conference, where we will discuss the exciting launch of NASA's two radiation belt storm probes, RBSP for short. Now, this is going to happen on August 23rd from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The two-year RBSP mission will help scientists develop an understanding of Earth's Van Allen radiation belts in related regions that pose hazards to humans and exploration, uh, robotic exploration for explorers. Before we get started, a few housekeeping duties. We have four panelists joining us today. Each will give a short four to six minute briefing on their specific topic. Besides seeing their graphics here on television, you can also see them on the website at www.nasa.gov rbsp. After the panelists' discussion, we'll move to the question and answer session, accepting questions from media here at NASA headquarters, those at the centers, and others from that dial into the telephone bridge. You can also ask questions submitted via the Twitter sphere by using the hashtag AskNASA. This media conference will be limited to one hour. Today's panelists include Lika Guhara Kurta, the Living with a Star program scientist from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Besides Lika, we have Mona Kessel, the RBSP program scientist, also from NASA headquarters. Barry Mock, the RBSP project scientist from Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. And Rick Fitzgerald, the RBSP project manager, from also from APL, Laurel, Maryland. And with that, let's get started. Here's Lika. Thank you, J.D. Um, good afternoon. After the very successful landing of uh, NASA's Mars Science Laboratory with all eyes focused on planet Mars, I think it's time to bring our attention back to planet Earth once again. Not only do we live here, but we are also launching the second mission of Living with a Star program called Radiation Belt Storm Probes, for short, RBSP. The radiation belts are the first and perhaps the oldest discovery of the space age, yet they remain a mystery simply because this is a very harsh environment where satellites don't last for very long and we don't have a lot of data. We still don't understand how the belts behave, uh, nor do we have the ability to make key predictions, which is really very important. And I hope with the launch of these two probes, we will be answering many of these questions. Um, my esteemed colleagues to my left, uh, they are going to talk about the details of the mission and its science. And let me talk a little bit about the program itself, Living with a Star program. Uh, most of you know that we live in the outer atmosphere of our star, the sun. And it's not only our planet, but every other planet, everything in the solar system is immersed in the solar uh, environment. Even though with our unaided eyes, we just kind of look at the sun and it looks like a placid yellow ball. When we look at the sun with um, you know, telescopes, uh, we find like Solar Dynamics Observatory, first mission of Living with a Star program, what we find is a really seething, boiling surface, a very dynamic uh, sun, which has tremendous uh, influence on the environment uh, in geospace. Even as we search for life on Mars, that's why we launched MSL, it is kind of interesting to know that under the protective shield of Earth's magnetosphere and atmosphere, Earth still remains an island uh, in the universe, I would say, in which life has evolved and flourished. And the origins and fate of life here on Earth is really intimately connected to the sun and solar variability and how the Earth responds to that. Recognizing this importance between the connection between sun and earth, sun and solar system, in 2001, NASA initiated a program called Living with a Star Program, whose goal is to really go after the signs of the connected sun-earth system, but the ones that have relevance to life and society. So basic science with, science, uh, with relevance to life and society kind of science in pasture mode. And this becomes very clear with this um, 
ch chart that I'm about to show you, which kind of gives you on the top panel the aspects of basic science, solar variability and its impact on our magnetosphere, something we will be studying with our BSP, solar variability and its impact on different kinds of planet, planetary environments that might or might not have magnetosphere, um, solar variability and its, yeah, not necessarily solar variability, but in general sort of uh, variability of radiation in the magnetized uh, universe. Uh, the plasma that surrounds us. Most of our universe is actually filled with magnetized plasma. So this mission is actually going to provide some critical insight into that as well. When we go to the lower uh, 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 panel, what you see is the relevant side of it. Essentially, uh, modern uh, human technology has become very susceptible to solar storms, <clears throat> solar uh, coronal mass ejections, solar wind. What you're looking in that picture are these that solar storms can affect satellites in space, astronauts doing extravehicular activity, power grids, uh, even smart power grids, uh, communication navigation system, uh, air traffic, uh, and even terrestrial climate. So there's a deep connection between how the sun varies and its relevance to <laughs> life and society. Now, in addition to the sun producing radiation, something that sun also produces is what's called a solar wind. This is a hot million miles per hour um, uh, wind, which consists of electrons and protons. And if I can get the next chart, please. And this, is, this kind of blows out continuously from the sun. And um, it's, it's the next movie, and, and what, what this shows is from the surface of the sun all the way, 93 million of miles away, our home, planet Earth. Now, this picture uh, was taken by five digital cameras on one of our missions called Stereo, and we are able to see for the first time the entire picture of a solar storm. 93 million miles. In between what you see are cloud of plasma. These are billion tons of material, electrons and protons, traveling at tremendous speed, impinging not only on our planet, that really blue dot, but also planet Venus and any other planets in the solar system. In the next movie, what we have done is we have taken those images, kind of distorted them into a radial coordinate so we can actually see the track of a coronal mass ejection or a solar storm in just one panel. So you are seeing 93 million miles captured in that one frame. And you see that the solar storms are blowing out from the surface of the sun, from the blue to the yellowish red, and then the interplanetary medium. This is billion tons of matter plowing through interplanetary medium. And just look at the size scale. Uh, it, it's just overwhelming to tiny planets like ours, Mars, Venus. And, and so how does our planet then respond to that kind of dynamic pressure? If you look at the next movie, that shows that Earth actually has its own magnetosphere. We call it almost like a cocoon that protects us from this harmful radiation of the sun. So the solar wind provides the dynamic pressure, and you're seeing that from the left. It impinges on the magnetosphere, and when the storm is really strong, you can see that the magnetosphere is not only shimmering, it get, gets squished distorted, all different kinds of phenomena. But this is happening constantly. And inside the magnetosphere, what we have are the radiation uh, belts. And these radiation belts are really important for us for a couple of reasons, uh, for uh, satellites in that environment, as well as for astronauts. Astronauts, for them to leave low Earth orbit, they have to punch through the radiation belts. And satellites, many of our key satellites actually go skimming through this uh, environment, and they spend, uh, spend their entire lifetime in this environment. And this is uh, not a pleasant environment. It's a harmful, harsh uh, environment. 
as I mentioned before, you know, we still don't understand how the radiation belts behave. Neither can we make uh, key predictions for the radiation belts. Uh, what are those key predictions? You know, we don't know, for example, where highly charged relativistic electrons will appear or disappear. These are really lethal, for example, to spacecraft charging. Uh, we, for example, don't know how the radiation belts will respond to any given coronal mass ejection. Will the belts shrink? Will the belts expand? Will the belts merge? I mean, you know, these three orthogonal questions, we don't have a good answer for that today. But with the launch of these two missions, we certainly think that we will have a much better understanding of what's going on there. Now I want to show you the last slide, and in the last slide, I want to draw your attention uh, to the solar cycle, the various phases of the solar cycle, and how our geospace environment and radiation belts respond to that environment. So on the top panel, what you're seeing is the red plot. I mean, that's your traditional solar cycle variability plot. Sun varies every 11 years, the sunspots go up and then go down, and we are kind of on the rising phase of that cycle. The blue plot superposed on that top panel essentially shows the response of the geospace environment, or in other words, you know, how the radiation belts would uh, respond to solar variability. And what you find, there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. They are not following the same pattern. Well, what goes on? The radiation belts and our geospace environment not only responds to the solar variability, but it also responds to the solar wind that we just showed you in the movie. The high-speed solar wind in blue in the lower panel, the slow-speed solar wind in green, um, the coronal mass ejections and other transients in red in the lower panel. They have all different variability. All of them together, along with the sunspot cycle, really contributes to what the radiation belt experiences. And this is what we are trying to understand. And going back to the basic points, we need to understand this because the weather in these belts is very important for us, much like the weather on surface of our planet, you know, like the tornadoes, the hurricanes. And we want to understand the weather in the radiation belts and its variation with solar cycle so that we can be better prepared for making uh, better satellite designs for our astronauts, for communications, all of those. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Mona, who will give you some history and more science on the radiation belts. OK, thank you, Lika, for setting the stage. That um, really puts this into perspective. I want to start by answering a couple of simple questions, starting with, what are the radiation belts? And then where are they? So if we can look at the first slide that I have, you can see a cutaway model of the Earth's radiation belt. You see the Earth, and you see there's an inner belt and an outer belt. And within these belts are captured, or trapped actually, high energy particles, pri primarily electrons and ions. They're trapped by Earth's magnetic field. You can also see the two satellites from RBSP that are pictured there as well. So the inner belt really begins about 1,000 miles up from Earth's surface and extends to about 8,000 miles. Then there's a gap, and the outer belt begins, and that's about 12,000 to about 25,000 miles. So those belts, that's kind of the uh, picture that you see when they're nominal, when there's not a lot going on. But during solar storms, which Lika just discussed, lots of things happen. The belts can expand greatly. So they fill in much closer to Earth. They can even fill in the region between the belts and expand out. So when they expand in, they get to about 125 miles above the surface of the Earth. That means that the International Space Station and low-orbiting satellites pass through that region. So they're susceptible to the energetic particles that are trapped there. The same thing happens on the outside. That's where our geosynchronous satellites are. And as the belts expand, those satellites come within that region, and they're also then susceptible to the possible damage from the particles. So I'll, let's stop about solar storms for a little bit, because I want to step back in time for a little bit, back to the 1950s when the space age began. As Lika's already mentioned, 
one of the first discoveries, the first satellite that went into space, discovered the inner belt of what we now know as the radiation belts. So if we can look at the next slide that I have, what I show here is a picture of four of the early pioneering scientists. From left to right, they're Carl McElwain, James Van Allen, George Ludwig, and Ernie Ray. All four of these men were very important to these early discoveries. Van Allen, in particular, was lecturing all around the country. He was trying to get people interested in doing science in space. So what he really wanted to study was cosmic rays. And you need to go above the atmosphere to study cosmic rays because that's where you're going to get the best view. And the, the rockets, the suborbital rockets that he'd been sending up for some years, those are only up for a few minutes and then come right back down. So he was very anxious to get a satellite in space. So in addition to, to uh, pushing this idea of doing cosmic rays in space, he was conversing with Werner, Werner von Braun and William Pickering, both of whom were very important in getting that first rocket to go up into space, the first U.S. rocket in space. So he, together with George Ludwig, designed the first instrument. And that instrument was just a simple Geiger counter, and that was to go up on Explore 1. So if we can show the next slide that I have, this is a very famous picture showing Pickering, Van Allen, and Von Braun holding up a model of Explore 1. This, is, this was a press conference that was held soon after... Uh, the launch of the rocket, and it was really important because it, it, it had not only national but also international significance. So soon after that, Van Allen and his team got very busy analyzing the data and simultaneously getting ready for Explorer 2 and 3, which we're going to launch in the next few months. But it, the data was perplexing because there were times when the count rates went very, very low. And it didn't make any sense that the cosmic rays in space would be zero. So then Explorer 3 confirmed that. So now McElwain, he went into the lab. He took their prototype Geiger counter, did a series of tests, and he was able to demonstrate that when the count rates got really high, like 25,000 counts per second, then the Geiger counter would actually respond with zero. So what they've got now is count rates that are a thousand times the cosmic rays. So that was that was really interesting. They got very, very busy then trying to piece that together and say, okay, what are we really looking at here? So they put together a map, and if we can look at the next slide, they, they did an analysis by latitude and longitude and altitude, and then they hand drew, and in, in fact, all of this was done without computers, so it was really quite an effort back at that time, they drew a version of the radiation belt because Van Allen deduced that there must be trapped radiation. And this was the picture that he came up with. Then later, he was giving a press conference on this. And um, he was describing these belts as encircling the earth. And so there was a reporter in the audience who asked him a question. He said, you mean like a belt? He said, yeah, like a belt. So that's where the term radiation belts came from, was a reporter asking a question at a press conference. And, and this discovery, this discovery of these radiation belts with the trapped radiation landed Van Allen on the cover of Time magazine. If we go to the next picture, which again shows the map, but now it shows Van Allen on the cover of Time magazine. This was in May 1959. But at that time, we thought that they were static belts, that they were fixed in location. Later satellites, Cress and Sampex, painted an entirely different picture. So if we can go to the movie now, I want to show you with Sampex data, starting in about 1998, pictures of the dynamic nature of the belts. You can see red areas. Those correspond to the belts getting really pumped up, lots of charged particles. Sometimes the belts, the, the red areas extend all the way through the region. Sometimes the outer one almost disappears. And then other times you can see them as two distinct belts. But one thing you definitely can see is that it's a highly dynamic region. So one satellite, unfortunately, could not unravel this complicated nature. This is a job for RBSP. But it also demonstrates a kind of weather in space that Lika has already mentioned. 
This is all driven by the sun, by the changing energy coming from the sun. And it actually affects the, the performance and the re reliability of technologies that we have here, both in space and on the ground. Now, in particular, if you look at the next slide, what RBSP will be able to do is give us information about spacecraft charging, spacecraft discharging, single event upsets. Sometimes the uh, solar panels will degrade because of the charges that, are, that, are, that, that come and they hit the panels. So this is something that Rick is going to talk about a little bit more later. But this aspect, this solar, the space weather is what we're concerned about. And in particular, when we have astronauts that fly through the area, they can get a dose of radiation. We know that prolonged exposure to radiation can cause cancer. So RBSP, is what it will do for us is in, enable the prediction of extreme and dynamic space weather conditions. We have broadcasting, both satellites, 24-7 space weather. This is going to get picked up by ground stations around the world. If we go to my final slide, we can see a picture of a ground station. This is the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute. They built a special dish just to, to capture the RBSP space weather data. We're also working with the Czech Republic. They have a ground station and other sites around the world. So as soon as that data becomes available, it will be broadcast out to the public. And this will support our efforts of analyzing space weather data around the world. So now I want to turn it over to Barry, who's going to talk about the mission in more detail. Thank you very much, Mona. I wanted to answer the most important question. As cool as Mars is, it does not have a radiation belt, so I won't be, uh, I won't be talking about Mars here. I wanted to start by showing a movie that illustrates the point that Mona was making and Lika, that the, um, uh, the radiation belts are highly dynamic. But what this movie also shows is that that dynamics is highly unpredictable based on what we know about the radiation belts right now. We know that variations in the sun cause what are called geomagnetic storms. Those storms are actually observable on the ground by, mag uh, by magnetometer measurements, and they show up as these strong dips that you see in the green curve in the upper right of this, uh, uh, of this movie. What we've learned is the response of the radiation belts to those storms, to those green dips, is highly variable. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, and we just do not understand why that, uh, uh, why that occurs. Uh, this movie, by the way, will be on the RBSB and NASA website, and you can study it yourself, and you can look at the response to those two different storms, and you'll see that it is very different, and it is just a mystery as to why that happens. On the next slide, uh, I wanted to sh uh, talk about the fact that since 1958, when the radiation belts were discovered, we've learned that when it comes to radiation regions in space, we are not alone uh, at all. Uh, radiation is created near the sun. Radiation is uh, created between the planets. It's strongly uh, created at all of the strongly magnetized planets. Here we show Earth and Jupiter, a radio image of Jupiter, but it also occurs at Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So radiation belts are are common. They also occur in distant regions of the, of the universe. Here is an image of, of X-ray image of the Crab Nebula, which is an image of the radiation belts of that, uh, of that system as well. One of the really important parts of the radiation uh, belt storm probes mission is to use Earth's radiation belt as a natural laboratory for studying how radiation uh, is created in space, how it varies in space, um, and why the creation of radiation in space is so common. Um, I'd like to go back to the, my first movie, if I may. I'd like to talk about another aspect of, uh, 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 of, the, uh, of the RBSP mission. I wanted to describe why it is so unique in terms of its ability to resolve the mysteries of uh, the Van Allen radiation belts. The first and most obvious point is the fact that there are two spacecraft. Uh, closely coordinated with, with each other. Um, two spacecraft allow you to determine the difference between a spacecraft uh, variations that occur because the spacecraft moves from one region to another region and variations that occur because of explicit time variations in the radiation belts. And as simple as that seems, that has been a fundamental impediment in our ability to understand the physics of uh, space environment, uh, uh, things like the radiation belts. Uh, this uh, movie shows 
the RBSP spacecraft with these red and green balls. And if you study it carefully, you'll see how the two spacecraft look at any one structure twice. And that looking at, uh, at structures twice uh, for, any, for any feature that you see allows us to make that uh, separation between space and time. Like on my next slide, I show a little bit more about uh, the orbit. The orbits are highly elliptical, they, uh, and they are that way bec because they're designed to cut through all of the different uh, structures of the radiation belt. The two spacecraft follow almost identical orbits, but not quite. In fact, one is a little faster than the other, and so sometimes these spacecraft are very close together. Sometimes they're very, very far apart as, uh, as far as the entire orbit. And that allows us to study small-scale structures, medium-scale structures, large-scale structures, so that we can uh, do all that we can to understand the various uh, parts of how this radiation belt uh, responds. There is another aspect of the RBSB mission that also makes it uniquely capable of resolving the mysteries of the, uh, of the radiation belt, and that is it carries with it the most comprehensive, highest quality instruments that have ever been used to study uh, radiation regions in space. It is exceedingly difficult to make measurements in the heart of the radiation belt because the particles penetrate your instruments and contaminate the measurements. And RBSP has technologies that allow it to make the cleanest measurements that have ever been done in this, uh, the heart of the radiation uh, uh, belts. I'd like to talk now with my next slide, um, the different classes of instruments that are on RBSP. And there are two classes. Uh, one class measures the particles themselves. And uh, on the next slide, if I can have that, this highlights the various components that are actually measuring the particles. Uh, these, these instruments measure particles from the lowest energies, about one electron volt, all the way to the highest energies that we need, about two billion electron volts. Uh, these, these measurements are made by six different instruments that are delivered by three different investigations. It's the ECT investigation, the RB SPICE investigation, and the RPS investigation. These instruments measure not only the radiation particles that we're very interested in, but it also measures uh, the ionized gases or plasmas that constitute the environment within which the radiation belts uh, reside. The other class of instruments that we have uh, shown on the next slide are the um, uh, magnetic and electric fields uh, experiments. Uh, the magnetic and electric fields in the radiation belts control the behaviors of the particles. It causes the particles to be energized and to, to be lost. Um, RBSP instruments measure uh, electric and magnetic fields that are uh, changing very slowly over many hours, and those that are changing very rapidly in the form of waves that propagate with frequencies as, as high as 400,000 uh, uh, cycles uh, uh, per second. And again, these electric and magnetic fields essentially control the behavior of the, of the particle instrument. And these uh, measurements uh, are made by th four different sensor types that are delivered by two different investigations, and that is the emphasis investigation and the EFW investigation. All of these instruments can only make their measurements by being integrated on a very capable spacecraft. Uh, these spacecraft have to be robust to the harsh environments. They have to be very quiet so that the, um, uh, uh, very quiet, uh, so that the fields and particles, uh, the fields par measurements can be made. And I forgot to show my last movie, which I'd like to show now, which shows one of the ways that we keep these uh, electric and magnetic field uh, uh, measurements very quiet by putting them out on boom-like uh, structures. And this movie, for example, shows the deployment of the magnetometer booms that are mounted on the end of the... Uh, of the solar, uh, solar panels, and we do that to keep these sensors far away from the spacecraft, which can contaminate the measurements. The electric field instruments are even more sensitive, and they are put on wire booms that extend 50 meters um, away from the spacecraft, so that from tip to tip, you're measuring the size of a, f uh, of a football field. So again, as I was saying before, uh, these instruments have to be put on a very uh, robust spacecraft, they have to be very quiet, and they have to be capable to keep themselves oriented with uh, respect to, this, uh, to the space that they're supposed to be oriented. And this task fell to um, Rick Fitzgerald, to my left, who is the program manager and his engineering team. And I'll let uh, you take it from there. Okay. Thank you, Barry. 
Um, I'm very pleased and happy and proud to be here today representing the entire RBSP team, uh, which includes uh, APL and all of our instrument teams that um, designed, built, tested, about to launch and will operate uh, these two satellites for the next two years. So you've, you've heard in great detail about the difficult environment that we're going we're gonna to launch these satellites into. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the design aspects of how do, we, how do we possibly live in that environment. So the first slide that I have here uh, shows our electronics that um, really we, we did two things uh, to be able to live in this radiation environment. The first is we picked uh, radiation-hardened um, parts. So electronic and uh, electrical parts are very sensitive to these highly charged particles. So uh, you can actually uh, buy some parts that are tested to higher levels of uh, radiation. And, uh, and so that, that's the first place we started. The second thing we did was uh, to shield all these critical electronics, both spacecraft subsystems and science instruments, in uh, 350 mils thick aluminum boxes. Uh, so that's approximately a third of an inch thick or uh, th some thinly sliced bread, as it gives you an idea of the thickness. And so essentially, the, the primary way that we're overcoming this difficult environment is to, is to go there in a suit of armor. And, uh, and that makes us one of the toughest missions um, tough in the sense that we can survive this, this environment that, that NASA's ever put together. Um, and you can see the text there installing some of those boxes in what we call the dog houses, so the, the shielding boxes we use. Next slide. So what we want to talk about next is um, the mission itself. So we, we've said there's two satellites, and you can see here the satellites are separating from the, uh, the launch vehicle. Uh, that separation will happen over Hawaii, uh, approximately 78 minutes after launch. Uh, we'll see that separation happen, and um, the, the satellites are injected into slightly different orbits, and that, that is uh, part of the mission design that Barry talked about, where we are able to make um, these measurements throughout the structure of the radiation belts um, with them separated in different ways, sometimes close together, sometimes further apart. And um, the injection of the orbit is critical to being able to do that. Um, <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, the deployment itself. So, so Barry showed you an animation, and you can see it there where the um, magnetometer booms are deployed. And you can see these wire booms coming out at you right there. Um, that's not in real time. <laughs> Uh, so these wire booms actually take a couple of weeks to deploy, and they are they're essentially on reels inside the spacecraft, kind of like a fishing reel, and they get played out um, over a period of two weeks, and uh, and that's all part of our 60-day commissioning timeline. So uh, in a very carefully choreographed series of turn-ons of the various instruments and, and subsystems on the spacecraft, um, we uh, we um, decide which um, instruments with with the science team will get turned on in which order and when these deployments will happen. And so um, the the animations that you saw are um, pointing to some of the uh, the fields measurements that are going to be made and um, and and showing you those deployments. Um, I did also want to talk about some of the integration and test activities um, that we've had on the program. So I have a series of video clips to show some of the key events and talk a little bit about what it is that they um, that they, that we've done with this mission that um, that are somewhat unique. So if we can roll that first video, uh, the first thing we have here are the solar panels, and um, there's a deployment test here to make sure the mechanisms work in a genegated environment for the solar panels to pop open, and then for those booms to deploy. Uh, the solar panels I will mention are especially designed to uh, dissipate surface charge, which is one of the things that we're concerned about with this mission. So um, those were key tests. I'm showing here a stacked vibration test. So with any, any satellite mission, this is one of the toughest environments to survive, and that's the launch environment with the ride that you get from the launch vehicle. And so we, we test as we fly in a stacked configuration. And then we uh, have a magnetic swing test. This is critically important because... The spacecraft has to be magnetically silent in order to make these sensitive magnetic fields measurements. And this test essentially is like walking through a magnetometer at the airport. Fortunately, we're, we're very quiet in that sense. The next you will see here is a, uh, 
a test of our, our separation mechanism from the launch vehicle and the clamp band. And uh, we have to make sure, obviously, that that separates successfully. And you can see there that deployment we did together with our, our launch vehicle provider um, back at APL. Um, we next have a, uh, a test that uh, I would show here with the electric uh, fields measurement. So there's also some antennas top and bottom on the spacecraft, and this is the first motion test of one of those antennas. And then we move to the thermal vacuum test, which is um, uh, pretty standard in the industry. Uh, you want to test in the thermal environment you're going to live in and, and under um, vacuum conditions. Uh, this is all done. All these tests were done at APL. Um, the two chambers that we have at APL are somewhat unique in that um, they open from the bottom and the spacecraft are actually deployed from bottom to top and uh, pushed up into the second floor, uh, bolted down, and then we run the test for about 30 days. Uh, the final test that I'm showing you here is uh, our, our, our spin test. And uh, we do this because the spacecraft spin at about 5 RPM nominally on orbit and we need to make sure they're well balanced. So this test is a lot like uh, taking um, car tires and getting them balanced at the garage. And uh, as you well know, uh, you can put some um, various weights of different parts on the wheel to make sure that, they, uh, that they're all balanced. And we do the same thing with the spacecraft. On orbit, um, we do have a period where we spin a little bit faster than nominal in order to make those deployments of the wire booms. Uh, but once we're in a nominal condition, we'll spin at about five RPM. Um, the final slide that I, I want to show you is uh, the spacecraft in the stacked configuration uh, down at the Cape. Uh, so this was just taken a few days ago um, inside the fairing. You can see there we're stacked on top of the launch vehicle adapter. And, um, and so the, the team has been working very hard over the a period of about five years uh, to get to this point. Uh, we're very proud of the mission. And um, as a runner, uh, there's a slogan that you see occasionally written on T-shirts, which, which says, uh, uh, my sport is your sport's punishment. And that's how we feel about this mission. So our mission is other missions punishment. Nobody really wants to live in the environment that we're going to live in for two years. And so um, it's taken a lot of effort uh, to overcome some of the challenges that I just spoke about to get to this point. And uh, we're very pleased and happy to be uh, uh, at, at this point, um, just uh, less than uh, a couple of weeks away from launch. So um, with that, I'd like to wrap it up. And um, I want to say a special thank you to the team uh, that we've assembled, this fantastic RBSP team that's pulled this mission together. Thanks, Rick. And with that, we'll start the question and answer session. We have a, a number of people joining us today from a variety of locations. So we ask that reporters uh, limit themselves to one question and one follow-up. We will go around a second time if time permits. Also, we'd like to have you identify yourself, your media affiliation, and then direct your question to a specific panelist, if at all possible, to avoid any confusion. For those on the telephone bridge who would like to ask a question, push the star one keys on your telephone to be placed in the queue. And once again, on Twitter, you can send your questions to hashtag AskNASA. And we do have uh, one question already in the queue from the uh, Twitter, field, Twitter sphere. Um, this question, I'm not sure who it's going to go to, but what's the impact of, on the mission if, for whatever reason, one of the probes doesn't work? Okay, I'll, I'll take that uh, question. The answer is, first of all, we anticipate that they're both going to work. They're... Had the, as you have just heard from Rick, they have been well-designed, well-tested, thoroughly tested, and so our anticipation is that they will work. However, if they don't work, if one of them doesn't work, then we still have these very sophisticated instruments out there that are capable of new measurements, of, of, of being able to map the radiation belts, and so that we think that we can achieve some really stunning science even if we only have one spacecraft. And I think I'll add to that. I think we have a situation, because this is part of living with a star, we are actually going to be able to study sort of the causes and consequences, the causes, solar variability, and its impact uh, even with one spacecraft. Thank you. I believe we have someone on the uh, radio, right on the uh, telephone, rather. It's Lisa Grossman from New Scientist. Um, hi, this, this is Lisa. Um, I was wondering why these questions have gone unanswered for so long. Probes like this weren't launched before. I didn't hear the question. 
Great. Now, the question was, how come the, uh, these questions oh. have gone on and unanswered for so long? Well, it, uh, I, let me take a, uh, take a stab at that. Uh, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, one of the greatest uh, advances uh, in understanding the uh, new dynamics of the radiation belts was the, was the Air Force uh, Crest mission that flew in the early 90s. And then uh, NASA flew the SAMPEX uh, mission, um, at, which is a low-altitude mission, but could monitor the uh, radiation belt over long uh, periods of time. But these were single spacecraft, and they, the fundamental issue of being able to separate spatial uh, variations from temporal variations, they just could not, uh, were not able to do that, and that's so fundamental uh, that, uh, that we really can't resolve the mysteries that are there without that capability. I also wanted to point out that there are uh, more recent technologies, instrument technologies, that really allow us to make much, much cleaner measurements in the radiation belt than we've ever been able to do uh, before. Uh, this, these penetrating particles get into the air instruments, they contaminate the measurements. It's just a very hard thing to do, and more recent technologies have allowed us to make much better measurements. And if I may add to that, I think we are studying the radiation belt for its science sake, intrinsic science, as it applies to the belts and elsewhere in the universe but it's also for its relevance to life and society. And I think space weather is a really emerging area where we are beginning to understand the impact of solar variability on our technology, uh, whether it's in the radiation belts elsewhere. And, and so recognizing that importance, I think we are uh, making sure that we have the appropriate observations and measurements to really understand uh, these systems. And, and I'm just, sorry, add no one last thing to that, which is that we are becoming very dependent on our space assets. We have more than 300 satellites in geosynchronous or orbit. I don't know how many we have in low Earth orbit. Well, we also have the space station up there. So these assets are very important. We have to understand the space environment, and that's what we're setting out to do. Sounds good. We're also going back to our telephone bridge once again with Clara Moskowitz from space.com. Yes, hi. My question, I think, is for Mona. Uh, you mentioned that the ISS sometimes passes through these belts if they expand down lower. Um, can you uh, say whether the ISS has recently made a pass through the belts and just how, high, how much higher is the radiation dose they experience than the normal ISS radiation dose? We have been going through a time where the sun has been very quiet, actually. So most of the time that the space station recently has been a time where we haven't had that much activity and we haven't had any, any recent times where the space station has, has been going through the radiation belts. The dosage that you might get on a quick pass-through is, is much less than you would get from a CT scan. So it's really only prolonged over the course of, of quite some time that you're going to get anything significant. Thanks, Mona. Uh, we have another Twitter question here. How will RBSP improve space, space weather predictions? I mean, uh, one of the ways we, we generate predictions is by generating uh, models, simulations and models of the, space, uh, of the space environment. We have preliminary simulations. They, do, uh, they are able to predict uh, uh, space weather to limited degrees. What we need to do is to solve the fundamental science of the radiation so that we can improve those, uh, those basic models. Many of those models are driven by the interplanetary environment. The, the solar wind comes at, uh, at the Earth's magnetosphere. It has a density. It has a velocity. It contains a magnetic field. And these uh, simulation models do have some preliminary predictions of what the consequences of those inputs are to the space environment around Earth. We do not, those models do not contain enough of the fundamental physics that we need to find out in order for those models to give a high fidelity prediction. And by improving the, our understanding of the fundamental physics in this region, those models will become higher and higher in fidelity and will improve our predictions. And, and also I'll add that some of the models are empirical models, which means that they actually take 
data that exists in that region and assimilate it into the model. And when we once we have the RBSP satellites up there, there'll be additional data that can be assimilated into the models. And as Barry said, we're going to have much higher fidelity. We'll go back to the uh, telephone bridge now with Al Stahler from KVMR Radio. Al Stahler, KVMR, question for Barry. Despite the radiation hardening, do you envision there might be a scenario when you would have to go into safe mode? Um, one of the um, one of the fundamental requirements of the uh, radiation belt uh, storm probes is it had to be designed to what we call operate through. The radiation belt storm probes are designed with an operate through requirement, which means that it has to take quality measurements during the worst of the. Uh, uh, the highest intensity radiation belt events. We've characterized that worst case environment uh, environment based on measurements that were made over the last couple of decades. And so the uh, uh, the spacecraft and its interior and all the instrument was designed with that worst case radiation environment uh, in mind. And so we absolutely do not anticipate that RBSP will go into safe mode because of high radiation. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question on the telephone bridge, push the star one keys on your telephone to be placed in the queue, and you can send your questions to hashtag AskNASA on the Twitter sphere. Uh, another question here, which I think is pretty interesting, is there any chance of harnessing the energy in the, in the belt since the flow is constant and the particles are charged? I can dive in there. <laughs> there question. I, uh, the answer is probably not. There's a tremendous amount of energy uh, within the radiation belts, but the energy density within the radiation belts, that means the energy per cubic meter, if you will, is in fact very, very low. And in order to harness an energy source, not only do you need a lot of energy, but you need a lot of energy density in order for it to be an efficient source of energy. So no, despite the fact that the radiation belts are very dangerous, very high energy in total, the energy density is, in fact, too small to be a practical source of energy. All right, back to the Twitter sphere. When do you expect the first science data? Um, go, we, go ahead, we, please. Um, we have a commissioning phase that's going to last about 60 days. And after that, we are going to be getting results out very quickly. We've actually targeted the American Geophysical Union meeting, which will be in December in San Francisco. And we have a special session there, and we're going to show some of our early results. we got to give the scientists a little bit of time to look at the data once we've gone through commissioning, but, but we're expecting that that meeting is going to be the first time that we're going to really have some good results. Okay. One more question here, and this involves uh, the educational component. How are students participating in this mission? I can start. <clears throat> uh, we actually have um, uh, flight, some of our flight controllers, our college students uh, from area universities who have been trained over the summer and um, an intense uh, period to be able to operate the satellites. Um, we also have a very robust um, EPO program uh, that involves uh, K through 12 and also um, uh, college students as well. Um, and Barry or Mona, you might have more details to talk I about just, on those. Well, I just want to point out that uh, the principal investigators of the various uh, investigations all come from major universities. They all have student involvement in the fundamental science that they are, they are doing. They had student involvement in the construction and design of the instruments at, at some always at some relatively low level, but, uh, but, uh, but involvement as well. And those students, again, will be involved in get, pulling the science out of the, uh, out of the data. This is a, our, our leads are uh, major participants in their university education programs. And, and I'll say a final note to that because I've been uh, going around the country several places. I've been doing some lectures on upcoming science of RBSP. And there are always lots of students there. The students are very excited and very interested. Sometimes the students make up a quarter of the audience. So I can tell you that there are a lot of students interested, and they'll be engaged in the analysis as soon as we get that data flowing. I think uh, Living with a Star program also has a summer school called Heliophysics Summer School, where we actually train 
the next generation of uh, who we call heliophysicists, who actually look at this broad interdisciplinary science, not only just radiation belt science, but how does the sun relate to what goes on in the radiation belt. Uh, we get about 40 students each year. We support undergraduate students, postdocs. So there are a number of ways we are trying to educate the next generation. Thank you. I believe we have uh, Space.com's Clara Moskowitz on the line again. Yes, thank you. Um, just a, a quick question and a slightly longer one. First of all, I'm wondering what the total cost of the mission is. And then secondly, I have a, a question uh, that maybe is a dumb question, but if you have such um, rigorous shielding on this spacecraft, then how are the instruments going to be able to measure all this radiation they're being exposed to? I'll answer the first question and let Rick answer the second question. The cost of this mission is about $670 million, and that includes the launch vehicle. You want me to answer the instrument? Sure. Yeah, the okay. That's an interesting question. <laughs> you know, one of the problems with measuring these radiation particles, is to measure them, you actually have to let them into the sensor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you're, uh, you can't shield everything out. You do uh, – you have a lot of shielding over most of the instrument. You control – the those particles that can can't come into the instrument there are very there are orifices openings that allow it in one of the the new technologies that allows us to make these measurements in a fashion that we have not been able to do before is the use of coincident measurements and what that means is a particle come in, comes in it me makes a measurement in it makes a signal in one part of the instrument it then goes further into the instrument and makes a signal in another part of the instrument and, and the timing between those two uh, signals is very, very short. And by using very fast circuitry, you can discriminate between those particles that you're trying to measure, we call it the foreground, from those particles that penetrate through the sides of the boxes or come in some other way. Uh, and so these, it's very sophisticated technology that allows you to separate out the good stuff from the bad stuff. Um, and so it, it, that's a very good question, and it's a very hard one uh, to achieve. But, uh, but uh, recent technologies have allowed us to do that. All right, a question here. You mentioned a, a dish being built in South Korea and another country. Is, is NASA actually downloading the data here in the U.S.? Or just relying on foreign partners? Oh, absolutely. I was talking about the space weather data. That's our broadcast that's, that's out 24-7. Okay. But absolutely, APL is the, is, is the site that is downloading the science data. There's a recorder on board, and so that data will be downloaded every day, well, maybe once a day, I think, right. uh, fr from that recorder, and it will be downloaded here in the U.S. and processed, and it will be sent out to all of the operating center. Each of the instruments has their own operating center. Right. So the primary ground station is at APL. We have an 18-meter dish at APL. Our mission operations center is there. And uh, as Mona said, we get about uh, seven and a half gigabits of data a day. So it's, it's kind of like uh, a DVD movie and a half every day that we download. And, and the, the science data itself um, is what we call bent pipe uh, transmitted to science operations centers distributed across the country for the various um, inst science uh, instrument institutions. Thanks. Uh, this question here r relates to that. Uh, what will the data actually look like? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one. Uh, it won't be pictures, because what, what we'll get are our counts of particles, and we will turn those into something we call phase space density, which will give us a a bigger picture of, of, of what the distribution is around the environment, which we will put into pictures at some point. And we'll get some squiggly lines that are, that are magnetic field data and electric field data, that are, and the squiggliness is what tells us what the characteristics of the wave are. And so those will be the primary data that come in but we will take those data and we will make them more accessible. And, I mean, that's what we use to, in order to interpret because it's actually the interactions between the particles and the waves which gives us the science. 
wanted to add mm -hmm. that, in fact, we w that is the, pr the low-level science products, but in fact, one can make pictures. The movie that, uh, that Mona showed and the movie that I showed were actually real data. They were taken from the SAMPEX uh, mission. They were interpreted and put into a three-dimensional context. And I am absolutely confident we will be doing exactly the same thing on the RBSB mission. Once we understand, we have to make certain assumptions in order to turn it into line plots into a three-dimensional movie. But once we understand the physics, we can make those, uh, the, we can put that into the data and we can actually display the data in that movie form. And I'm, like I said, I'm sure we will be doing that. Yeah, because that's actually very useful for yeah. the scientists as well as for the public because pictures tell stories very well. And you can see as you were watching those movies, you got a really good sense of what was happening in the radiation belts. So we will use that, and, and Barry's right, we will, we will achieve these kinds of movies at some point, but it won't be immediate. Thanks. We're going back to the telephone bridge now with Lisa from New Scientist. Hey, I had a, a follow-up question, um, or following up on Clara's question. Um, Rick, you were talking about um, shielding the the space the, the instruments from the background particles, the particles you don't want, and then letting in certain particles. But if they're all the same particles in the radiation belt, how do you decide which ones you want as background and which ones you want to let in? That, that's actually a better one for Barry. Um, I can give a simplistic answer, but Barry can give a very detailed answer. Do you want to field that one, Barry? Well, uh, uh, as I said in a previous answer, you do shield most of the instrument very, very robustly, but you do have to have a, an aperture that allows some particles to come in. Uh, the uh, particles come through that aperture, and they're more or less coming all from the same uh, from the same direction, and they will hit a uh, they will hit some kind of detector, but that detector can also be hit by particles coming from other directions. And that's when this, where this coincidence circuitry, coincidence measurement, because that particle coming in a straight line will hit one detector and then proceed into the uh, volume of the, of the uh, sensor and hit another detector. And by demanding that when I get hit by one detector, I also get hit on the other detector, I can tell what direction that particle came from. I can tell that it came through the proper aperture and that it did not come through some other direction. So it's a very sophisticated set of detectors inside the, uh, inside the box that allows you to discriminate from those particles coming from the wrong direction from those particles coming from the right direction. But maybe, maybe to add to that, Barry, the, the question is, we are actually going to be sampling from lots of different directions because we really do want to know which direction in general or the particles are coming from. And there are times when they come from one direction primarily, and our instrument will be able to tell us that because we'll be sampling from a larger set of directions, but we will see that, oh, they're all coming from this direction. And we'll continue with that, and that's going to be in, in, in three dimensions so that we will really be able to tell where these particles are coming from. And let me add that one of the important aspects, that this is a spinning spacecraft. So sometimes the detector looks in one direction and then it's spinning around. So at different times in the spin, it is looking in different directions. And that's, how, that's one of the more important ways that we get the directionality of the particles that are coming, uh, coming to the spacecraft. And one final point, and this is the simplistic part, um, that I could summarize. Uh, the detecting part of the instruments is specifically made to withstand, that, that's what they're there for, to measure these, these high-energy particles. Uh, the other parts of the instrument are the electronics that support these detector circuits, and, and those are the ones we want to protect. So the design of the instrument itself is made to, to detect what we want to and screen out uh, the things that we don't want to harm the instrument. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to run out of time here, but we'd like to uh, say thanks to our panelists for an outstanding job today. For more information about this exciting mission when it launches two weeks from now, visit us at www.nasa.gov rbsp. And for more information about NASA or any of its many projects, visit us on the web at www.nasa.gov or go to any of our many social media venues such as Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and YouTube. That's going to do it for today. Have yourself an outstanding day.